I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. My name is Robert Benham. I'm a retired judge and lawyer whose professional career was spent in Memphis, Tennessee. The purpose of this course was to expose people of all ages to the civil rights movement in the South that existed between the years 1955, ending with the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968. So, we go to Birmingham, 1963. In January of 1963, Alabama had a new governor, one George Wallace, who after his defeat by John Patterson in a prior election, vowed, quote, he would never be, quote, end quote, out niggered again, and in his inauguration speech on the Capitol steps in Montgomery, delivered an address that included this language. Today, I have stood where once Jefferson Davis stood and took an oath to my people. It is very appropriate that from this cradle of the Confederacy, this very heart of the great Anglo-Saxon Southland, that today we sound the drum for freedom as have our generation of forebears before us done time and again down through history. Let us rise to the call of freedom-loving blood that is in us and send our answer to the tyranny that clanks its chains upon the South in the name of the greatest people that have ever trod this earth. I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny and I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. <laughs> The response by the movement under the leadership of Fred Shuttlesworth and Martin Luther King would focus on Birmingham, as Birmingham was felt by many to be the most segregated city in the South. Parks, playgrounds, theaters, swimming pools, restaurants, hotels, and even elevators were segregated. No white-owned stores employed blacks as clerks, and there were no black firemen or policemen on the city payroll. Like Memphis, where I spent most of my adult life, sanitation workers were 100% black. Beginning the first week of April 1963, there were over 60 consecutive nightly mass meetings with singing, rocking the walls of black churches. This was followed by sit-ins, boycotts, mass marches, and meetings. Martin Luther King was arrested on Good Friday, April 12, 1963, and jailed for leading a parade without a permit. And there's his booking. Coincidentally, this was the same date eight Alabama clergymen posted a public statement they felt was aimed at diffusing this volatile environment. And I want to re I read or reread, if you've already read it, one particular paragraph that stands out in King's response. And this is from the ministers. We commend the community as a whole and the local news media and law enforcement in particular on the calm manner in which these demonstrations have been handled. We urge the public to continue to show restraint should the demonstrations continue and the law enforcement officials to remain calm and continue to protect our city from violence. The response was the now famous letter from the Birmingham jail as authored by Dr. King. And admittedly, the first time I did this course, I had never read it in its entirety. Uh, and that was a terrible mistake. This is a true masterpiece reflecting the feelings of the oppressed concerning the oppressor. And I hope, I hope you've taken the time to read it. And if not, I would heartily recommend that each of you take the 20 minutes necessary to methodically read and digest this material. 
It's truly the backbone of this course. And to think, it was written not on a well-organized pad, but on scraps of paper, including margins of newspapers, and then smuggled out of his cell. But more important, one paragraph stands out, and this is in response to the letter from the ministers. Before closing, I feel impelled to mention one other point in your statement that has troubled me profoundly. You warmly commend the Birmingham Police Force for keeping order and preventing violence. I doubt that you would have so warmly commended the police force if you had seen its dogs sinking their teeth into unarmed Negroes. I doubt that you would so quickly commend the policemen if you were to observe their ugly and inhumane treatment of Negroes here in their city jail, if you were to watch them purse and push and curse old Negro women and young Negro girls, if you were to observe them slap and kick old Negro man and young boys, if you were to observe them, as they did on two occasions, refuse to give us food because we wanted to sing our grace together. I cannot join you in your praise of the Birmingham Police Department. With change in Birmingham not happening, despite all the protests, organizers in May of 1963 enlisted teenagers and even younger children to march. This was the children's crusade so as to bring national publicity to the state of affairs that existed in Birmingham. Initially, Bull Connor's police stopped these miners, rounded them up, and placed over 1,000 teenagers and younger children in jail. This proved to be a national embarrassment, so Connor changed course, and to keep the children out of downtown Birmingham, he decided to use force. Tear gas, fire hoses, dogs on children, continuation of dogs on children that goes on and on. Firefighters again spraying these children, and there's Bull Connor, himself, and to the right, more of the fire hoses. Needless to say, these images were the centerpiece of national news and national outrage, that is, outside of the South. Birmingham, in turn, promised to make changes, but this only invigorated the Klan, which in turn had rallies in Birmingham, and one speaker was heard in a speech shouting, quote, Martin Luther King's epitaph can be written here in Birmingham, end quote. And that very night, the motel in which Dr. King was staying was dynamited. You see and hear these one dynamiting after another dynamiting throughout this whole period of time. Coincidentally, this was the very same day, June 11th, the Governor Wallace stood in the courthouse door. It was the same day President Kennedy went on television and announced that he was sending to Congress what was to be sweeping civil rights litigation. It was the same day that Medgar Ever Evers was assassinated in his own driveway. It was the same day that Martin Luther King announced that he would have the march in Washington, D.C. in August. So a lot was happening on June 11th. And I debated long and hard about the Kennedy speech. But the more I listened to it and the more I digested the content of it, the more I felt that it would be most appropriate for all of us here in this room to take the 10 minutes to hear this speech, which was the forerunner of all of the subsequent civil rights litigation. I doubt that Kennedy could have passed it, Johnson could have passed it, and Johnson did pass it, but it was Kennedy's inspiration. Now an address by the President of the United States, speaking live from Washington. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This afternoon, following a series of threats and defiant statements, the presence of Alabama National Guardsmen was required on the University of Alabama to carry out the final and unequivocal order of the United States District Court of the Northern District of Alabama. That order called for the admission of two clearly qualified young Alabama residents 
who happened to have been born Negro. That they were admitted peacefully on the campus is due in good measure to the conduct of the students at the University of Alabama who met uh, their responsibilities in a uh, constructive way. I hope that every American, regardless of where he lives, will stop and examine his conscience about this and other related incidents. This nation was founded by men of many nations and backgrounds. It was founded on the principle that all men are created equal and that the rights of every man are diminished when the rights of one man are threatened. Today we are committed to a worldwide struggle to promote and protect the rights of all who wish to be free. And when Americans are sent to Vietnam or West Berlin, we do not ask for whites only. It ought to be possible, therefore, for American students of any color to attend any public institution they select without having to be backed up by troops. It ought to be possible for American consumers of any color to receive equal service in places of public accommodation, such as hotels and restaurants and theaters and retail stores, without being forced to resort to demonstrations in the street. And it ought to be possible for American citizens of any color to register and to vote in a free election without interference or fear of reprisal. It ought to be possible, in short, for every American to enjoy the privileges of being American without regard to his race or his color. In short, every American ought to have the right to be treated as he would wish to be treated, as one would wish uh, his children to be treated. But this is not the case. The Negro baby born in America today, regardless of the section of the state in which he is born, has about one half as much chance of completing a high school as a white baby born in the same place on the same day. One third as much chance of completing college. One third as much chance of becoming a professional man. Twice as much chance of becoming unemployed. About one seventh as much chance of earning $10,000 a year. A life expectancy which is seven years shorter and the prospects of earning only half as much. This is not a sectional issue. Difficulties over segregation and discrimination exist in every city, in every state of the Union, producing in many cities a rising tide of discontent that threatens the public safety. Nor is this a partisan issue. In a time of domestic crisis, men of goodwill and generosity should be able to unite regardless of party or politics. This is not even a legal or legislative issue alone. It is better to settle these matters in the courts than on the streets, and new laws are needed at every level. But law alone cannot make men see right. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. The heart of the question is whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities, whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. If an American, because his skin is dark, cannot eat lunch in a restaurant open to the public, if he cannot send his children to the best public school available, if he cannot vote for the public officials who represent him, if, in short, he cannot enjoy the full and free life which all of us want, then who among us would be content to have the color of his skin changed and stand in his place? Who among us would then be content with the counsels of patience and delay? One hundred years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slaves, yet their heirs, their grandsons, are not fully free. They are not yet freed from the bonds of injustice. They are not yet, not yet freed from social and economic oppression. And this nation, for all its hopes and all its boasts, will not be fully free until all its citizens are free. We preach freedom around the world, and we mean it. 
and we cherish our freedom here at home. But are we to say to the world, and much more importantly, to each other, that this is a land of the free, except for the Negroes, that we have no second-class citizens, except Negroes, that we have no class or caste system, no ghettos, no master race, except with respect to Negroes. Now the time has come for this nation to fulfill its promise. The events in Birmingham and elsewhere have so increased the cries for equality that no city or state or legislative body can prudently choose to ignore them. The fires of frustration and discord are burning in every city, north and south, where legal remedies are not at hand. Redress is sought in the streets, in demonstrations, parades, and protests, which create tensions and threaten violence and threaten lives. We face, therefore, a moral crisis as a country and a people. It cannot be met by repressive police action. It cannot be left to increase demonstrations in the streets. It cannot be quieted by token moves or talk. It is a time to act in the Congress, in your state and local legislative body, and above all, in all of our daily lives. It is not enough to pin the blame on others, to say this is a problem of one section of the country or another, or deplore the facts that we face. A great change is at hand. And our task, our obligation, is to make that revolution, that change, peaceful and constructive for all. Those who do nothing are inviting shame as well as violence. Those who act boldly are recognizing right as well as reality. Next week, I shall ask the Congress of the United States to act, to make a commitment it is not fully made in this century to the proposition that race has no place in American life or law. The federal judiciary has upheld that proposition in a series of forthright cases. The executive branch has adopted that proposition in the conduct of its affairs, including the employment of federal personnel, the use of federal facilities, and the sale of federally financed housing. But there are other necessary measures which only the Congress can provide and they must be provided at this session. The old code of equity law under which we live commands for every wrong a remedy. But in too many communities, in too many parts of the country, wrongs are inflicted on Negro citizens and there are no remedies at law. Unless the Congress acts, their only remedy is the street. I am therefore asking the Congress to enact legislation giving all Americans the right to be served in facilities which are open to the public, hotels, restaurants, theaters, retail stores, and similar establishments. This seems to me to be an elementary right. Its denial is an arbitrary indignity that no American in 1963 should have to endure, but many do. I have recently met with scores of business leaders urging them to take voluntary action to end this discrimination and I've been encouraged by their response. And in the last two weeks, over 75 cities have seen progress made in desegregating these kinds of facilities. But many are unwilling to act alone. And for this reason, nationwide legislation is needed if we are to move this problem from the streets to the courts. I'm also asking Congress to authorize the federal government to participate more fully in lawsuits designed to end segregation in public education. We have succeeded in persuading many districts to desegregate voluntarily. Dozens have admitted Negroes without violence. Today, a Negro is attending a state-supported institution in every one of our 50 states. But the pace is very slow. Too many Negro children entering segregated grade schools at the time of the Supreme Court's decision nine years ago will enter segregated high schools this fall, having suffered a loss which can never be restored. The lack of an adequate education denies the Negro a chance to get a decent job. The orderly implementation of the Supreme Court decision, therefore, cannot be left solely to those who may not have the economic resources to carry the legal, ac legal action or who may be subject 
to harassment. Other features will be also requested, including greater protection for the right to vote. But legislation, I repeat, cannot solve this problem alone. It must be solved in the homes of every American, in every community across our country. In this respect, I want to pay tribute to those citizens north and south who've been working in their communities to make life better for all. They are acting not out of sense of legal duty, but out of a sense of human decency. Like our soldiers and sailors in all parts of the world, they are meeting freedom's challenge on the firing line, and I salute them for their honor and their courage. My fellow Americans, this is a problem which faces us all in every city of the North as well as the South. Today, there are Negroes unemployed two or three times as many compared to whites. Inadequate education, moving into the large cities, unable to find work, young people particularly out of work without hope, denied uh, equal rights, denied the opportunity to eat at a restaurant or a lunch counter or go to a movie theater, denied the right to a decent education, denied almost today the right to attend a state university even though qualified. It seems to me that these are matters which concern us all, not merely presidents or congressmen or governors, but every citizen of the United States. This is one country. It has become one country because all of us and all the people who came here had an equal chance to develop their talents. We cannot say to 10% of the population that you can't have that right, that your children can't have the chance to develop whatever talents they have, that the only way that they are going to get their rights is to go in the street and demonstrate. I think we owe them and we owe ourselves a better country than that. Therefore, I'm asking for your help in making it easier for us to move ahead and to provide the kind of equality of treatment which we would want ourselves, to give a chance for every child to be educated to the limit of his talent. As I've said before, not every child has an equal talent or an equal ability or equal motivation, but they should have the equal right to develop their talent and their ability and their motivation to make something of themselves. We have a right to expect that the Negro community will be responsible, will uphold the law, but they have a right to expect that the law will be fair that the Constitution will be colorblind, as Justice Harlan said at the turn of the century. This is what we're talking about, and this is a matter which concerns this country and what it stands for. And in meeting it, I ask the support of all of our citizens. Thank you very much. It was just after midnight on June 11th, same day as that speech, same day as Wallace in the schoolhouse door, that Medgar Evers, a civil rights leader in Mississippi who was returning home from an NAACP meeting in Jackson, was shot in the back by a sniper's bullet just outside his own front door. And let's detail that tragic event. Evers was a World War II veteran who became active in the civil rights movement and was field secretary for the NAACP in Mississippi. Evers had been one of the strongest of the civil rights workers in Mississippi and was instrumental in James Meredith being admitted to the University of Mississippi at Oxford. He was also instrumental in sit-ins in Jackson, the swim-ins in Biloxi, and the integration and the swim-ins in Biloxi is just amazing. Biloxi is on the Gulf Coast. I've been there many times. It's all you know, salt water, and you have public beaches, but you had segregated beaches. The integration of Jackson's parks and buses, and on June 11th of 63, Evers was at a meeting uh, with NAACP lawyers in downtown Jackson, Jackson, Mississippi, returning home just after midnight with his wife and children waiting on him, and here's a picture of his family. He was shot in the back as he walked from his vehicle to his house. He was rushed to a hospital in Jackson, initially refused admittance because he was black, and after discussion about admittance, died. Evers was subsequently buried in Arlington National Cemetery with full military honors and a crowd of 3,000 3, in attendance. More photos from the burial and his stone 
On June 23rd, one Byron de la Beckwith was arrested for murder at two trials, two trials before all white juries in February and April of 64. Deadlocks resulted in failure to reach a verdict. De La Beckwith moved to Signal Mountain, Tennessee, a suburb of Chattanooga where I grew up, and was always sporting the weapon, and lived in obscurity for over 30 years. In 1994, he was again prosecuted based on newly discovered evidence and finally convicted. He died in prison in 2001. Now let's go back to June 11th. As I said previously, a lot was happening. Evers, assassination, Wallace, Kennedy, and on that same day, Martin Luther King announced a massive march and nonviolent protest would take place on August 28, 1963 in Washington, D.C. This was not the first proposed D.C. protest. In 1941, A. Philip Randolph, who had founded the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, proposed such a march. Subsequently, at a meeting with FDR, he was promised an executive order forbidding discrimination in the defense industry, and the march was called off. Earlier in 63, Randolph, still a force to reckon with, and his friend and associate, Bayard Rustin, began reformulating such a plan. And remember, they were the principals in the 1947 bus ride that ended up with Rustin and others being on a chain gang in North Carolina. Kennedy, like Roosevelt some 22 years earlier, wanted the march canceled. This was not to be. There was an alliance of the NAACP, Roy Wilkins, Congress of uh, Racial Equality, Jim Farmer, National Urban League, Whitney Young, and John Lewis, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Kennedy, on the other hand, seeing all of the violence and unrest in the South, proposed legislation, and you saw his speech about the legislation. He was of the opinion that any legislation he proposed would be harmed by this march because he did not think the march would be peaceful. But under the leadership of Randolph and Rustin, Wednesday, August 28, 1963, was set as the date for the march. While plans were being made, voter registration drives were taking place throughout the South, Greenwood, Mississippi, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, Somerville, Tennessee, Danville, Virginia, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina, Helena, Arkansas, on and on and on. Meanwhile, plans for the march continued with the goal of having 100,000 people descend on Washington. Logistics were dawning for a crowd of that size. Doctors, drinking water, and D.C. is hot and humid in the summer, isn't it, Ted? Miserable. <laughs> Toilets, a sound system, and route preparation for a crowd that would be, sending, be descending from every direction and by every means of transportation available. Press passes had to be obtained and issued for over 3,000 members of the media expected to attend. The program began at 1 p.m., and by that time, there was estimated to be a crowd of not the 100,000, but of 250,000 on hand, and people continued to pour in. Final estimates ranged as high as 500,000. And see, here's King and Notables in attendance, another view of the crowd, and an aerial view. There were many speeches, but by far the most memorable was from King himself. We're going to show just portions of this, the first three minutes and the last four or five minutes.
At this time, I have the honor to present to you the moral leader of our nation. I have the pleasure to present to you Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. One hundred years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. One hundred years later, the, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friend, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be, be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a 
dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. And every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain. And the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day, this will be the day when all of God's children be able to sing with new meaning, my country tears of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrims cried. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring. From the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom ring. From the mighty mountains of New York, let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the crevaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, and when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Well, the march was peaceful, and the organizers were invited to the White House for a meeting with the President and the Attorney General. A little over two weeks later, and after this success, we must again turn our attention back to Birmingham, where little progress was being made. One step forward, two steps backward. And then on Sunday, September 15th, 1963, there was the horrific bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. Picture the church before the bombing, after the bombing, the interior, resulting in the deaths of Addie Mae Collins, 14, Carol Denise McNair, 11, Carol Robertson, 14, and Cynthia Wesley, 14, plus the injury of at least 22 others. The reaction in the black community was incendiary and resulted in firebombings of at least five businesses and numerous cars being driven by whites were stoned. On the other hand, Johnny Robinson, 16, was shot in the back and killed by a Birmingham policeman as he was running down an alley. The police officer was never prosecuted. Virgil Ware, 13 black, was shot and killed by one Larry Sims, 16, who had a revolver and was going home from an anti-integration rally. Later, convicted of second degree murder, Sims received a suspended sentence with two years probation. Justice. 
Governor Wallace sent 300 state troopers into the city to quell rioting, and the Attorney General sent 25 FBI agents, some of whom were explosive experts, to investigate the bombing. By September 20, the FBI concluded that the bombing had been done with a device placed under the front steps of the church. Investigators focused on the Cahaba Boys, a splinter group of the Ku Klux Klan, and particularly Thomas Blanton Jr., Herman Cash, Robert Chambliss, and Bobby Cherry. On May 13th, both local investigators and the FBI formally named these four as the perpetrators. The information was sent to J. Edgar Hoover, who blocked impeding prosecutions. It was in 1980 that the Justice Department concluded Hoover had, in fact, not only blocked the prosecution, but had also officially closed the investigations in 1968. Unfortunately, this seems to be a recurring theme in our history of the FBI in the 50s and 60s. In fact, from an official standpoint, the bombing remained unresolved until one William Baxley was elected Attorney General of Alabama in January of 71. Baxley was a student at the University of Alabama in 63 and had been horrified about the bombing. Robert Chambliss was indicted on four counts of murder in September of 77. This was reduced by the judge to one count and on November 18th, Chambliss was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Chambliss died in October of 85 while still incarcerated. Throughout his trial and appeal, he insisted that one Gary Thomas Rowe, supposedly an FBI informant, and we're gonna hear more about him toward the end of the Selma segment in the next hour, another very, very shady character, was the perpetrator. <coughs> 37 years after the fact, on May 16, 2000, an Alabama grand jury under former Senator Doug Jones, and then a prosecuting attorney, presented facts that caused the indictments of Blanton and Cherry with counts of first-degree murder and universal malice, whatever that is. Blanton's trial began on April 24th, and after a week-long trial, he was convicted of first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison. Blanton died June 26, 2020, while still in prison. Cherry was tried on May 6th of 2002, and on May 28th was found guilty on four counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. He died of cancer in prison on November 18th, 2004. Herman Cash, the fourth conspirator, died in 1994. Let's take a short break and then we'll come back and talk about Selma, still in the state of Alabama.